it's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jack Heineman, our next speaker. I, I feel that I know Jack quite well. And I could go on and on telling you about him. But I'll keep it brief. Jack is a professor of molecular biology and genetics at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch. And uh, <laughs> Canterbury will appreciate that. And uh, has served on um, the International Assessment on Agricultural Knowledge, Science, and Technology for Development, the ISTAT, and currently serves on the Ad Hoc Technical Expert Group for uh, the UN Convention on Biodiversity for the Cartagena Protocol. So would you join me in welcoming Jack? <laughs> I'd like to change gears slightly and, and talk about agriculture as an ecosystem and to talk about how we do agriculture, including the socioeconomic and other kinds of inputs that determine what kind of agricultural ecosystem we have. I have from time to time heard very strident claims about various forms of biotechnology. And because of my past working on some of the UN uh, projects, such as the ISTAT, because of that past, I wanted to test some of those claims. So in, in recent years, we've been looking at such things as yield gains that are attributed to certain forms of biotechnology, and also to increases or decreases in agroecosystem sustainability. To do this, we try to avoid some of the more classic problems of meta-analyses and other ways of measuring the impacts of biotechnologies on agriculture by uh, looking at what we thought were equivalent or near-equivalent agroecosystems, at least in their choices. So we didn't compare an agroecosystem like the United States to uh, South Africa. We decided to choose agroecosystems that were roughly equal in wealth, roughly equal in latitude, and in history and in farmer education. So we decided to compare North America and Western Europe. We have certain common goals for agriculture. All of us want more nutritious and tasty food. We want to produce this food using less land because we know the agricultural footprint is devastating to biodiversity. We would like fewer exotic pesticides and fertilizer inputs. We'd like to use less water. And we'd like less carbon to come out the end. So how do we achieve an agricultural ecosystem that meets these goals and demands? I have heard claims that it's already been done. So for example, the uh, former science advisor to the US Secretary of State, Nina Fedorov, and a recent visitor to this country, has said in unequivocal terms, the science is quite clear on the benefits of GM crops. The reason farmers turn to genetically modified crops is simple. Yields increase and costs decrease. Given the strength of these claims, I expect to find equally powerful evidence to back them. So we began with Nina's home country, the United States, and its nearest neighbor, Canada. And we compared that to a collection of countries that the UN Food and Agriculture Organization already bands together under the database Western Europe. So this is a natural grouping by the UN FAO. Now, we chose these countries because they're in the same hemisphere, so the north, and hence share the same growing season. They're roughly in the same latitude. What you see here in this picture is a map of European cities spread across North America, so you can get a sense of where they are. And you can also get a sense of where the major growing staple crop growing regions are for the US, such as the US Midwest. They have equal access to biotechnologies. 
And when I say the word biotechnology, I mean it in its broadest sense. I do not mean GM. I mean everything people do to manage their soil, manage their ecosystem, as well as to breed crops. They have equal access to elite germplasm, and they're a mechanized and roughly equally educated sector, farming sector. We began by looking at, uh, well, we looked at three crops that they had in common, and we began with the first, maize, or what the Americans call corn. What is characterizing the North American agri-ecosystem in maize is that it has a low overall germplasm biodiversity. It's grown on increasingly depleted soils, requiring higher and higher input levels, so exogenous sources of fertilizer. There is a reduction in farmer contribution to the production system. So the farmers are becoming more and more estranged from the activities that we used to associate with farming. They are more now given farming protocols and technology packages. Hence, uh, there is a, a reduction in farmer choice of what they can grow. Higher and higher pesticide usages, and there's a concentration of breeder power and the breeders are those who sell the seeds. So how did the US and in many other parts of the world, how did we get there? We did what is still the longest term analysis of yields in maize by using the UN FAO database on historical yield uh, outputs. So what you see here is yield as a measure of weight per area grown dates back to 1961, and in this initial analysis, which we published in 2013, the, um, the lines go to 2010, but for the US, we also were able to conclude at that time data from 2012. The dotted blue line are yields for Western Europe and the solid brown line are the yields for the United States, the maize powerhouse. And what you can see in general terms is that from 1961 until 1985, in general, the US was much better at growing maize than was Western Europe, as measured by yield. Around 1985, Western Europe catches up. And it hasn't looked back. So it, on average, produces precisely the same amount as the United States. We also know, however, that Western Europe has chosen different ways to grow its maize than has the United States. So what this says, face value, is that the entire combination of options countries adopt for their agroecosystems are important for determining the ultimate behavior of their agroecosystem. Western Europe has gone from being a much lower efficient producer of maize to now one that is equal or exceeds US production in the last 50 years. So while over 50 years, the average yields are about the same between the two agri-ecosystems. If you draw the regression lines over those 50 years, what you find is that Western Europe is increasing its yields of maize significantly faster than is the United States. And those projections are set to continue. So once again, in this analysis, we stopped at the year 2010. Subsequently, we were able to add more data as it came in from 2011, 2012, et cetera. And the projections hold. Western Europe continues to increase its maize yields faster than does the United States. One of the most glaring differences between the United States and Western Europe in the last 15 years is that the United States has adopted genetically modified maize and Western Europe has not. That does not seem to have penalized in any way the production from Western Europe. We also noticed a, a, a um, clear but not statistically significant trend 
in the variability of the two agroecosystems. So if you look at the peaks and troughs from year to year, measuring the outputs, the yield outputs of the two agroecosystems, by a measure of the coefficient of variation, what you see is that the peaks and troughs characterized in the US system are much larger than they are in Western Europe. The annual variation in maize yields in the United States can be as high as 89 trillion kilocalories. This is the annual variation in output. This is something like six times the kilocalories lost during the southern corn leaf, leaf blight epidemic of 1970. That was an epidemic. Annually, the US can vary by six times that amount of food output, food energy output. This is suggestive of an agroecosystem that is highly prone to shock, that it's stressed. The second crop we looked at that's in common between North America and Western Europe is rapeseed, oilseed rape, or as it's called in North America usually, canola. What you can see is that Western Europe has always produced more oilseed rape per area than has, say, Canada. So that crop is mainly a Canadian crop. But in the last half of the period, the rate of increase in yield in Western Europe has been significantly greater than the rate of increase in yield in North America or in Canada. And that rate of increase in yield has not been diminished by the adoption of a near 100% GM canola crop in Canada over the last 15 years. In other words, Western Europe not only produces more oilseed rape per area than does Canada, its yields are increasing faster than Canadian yields, and it has done that without GM. The third crop we looked at that's in common between the two agroecosystems was wheat. And we thought wheat was a good choice. First off, it's an important crop for both agroecosystems. So both North America and Western Europe are major producers of wheat. But secondly, nowhere in the world is wheat genetically modified. We are comparing two agroecosystems and have eliminated the variable of one form of biotechnology, genetic modification. What you can see by the orange line is Western European yields. Again, Western Europe, by yield basis, has always produced more wheat than has uh, the United States. The rate of increase in yield is significantly better in Western Europe over the last 50 years than it has been in the United States. This tells us that the package of biotechnologies including, among them, the innovation strategies that determine which biotechnologies are chosen in an agroecosystem, the package that has been adopted by Western Europe is benefiting all of its crops. And the package that has been accepted and used in the United States is penalizing all of its crops by limiting the potential for their yields and their yield gains relative to another advanced agroecosystem. We also wanted to look at indicators of sustainability. Such indicators are external inputs, and we focused here on pesticides. Choosing 1995 as our reference year, the year before the first commercial introduction of genetically modified crops, we looked at both insecticide use in orange and herbicide use in yellow. Since 1995 is the reference year, the US was using 100%, of course, in 1995. We did find, in agreement with others, that there has been a 15% reduction in chemical insecticide use in the US agroecosystem up until 2007, the last year that the US reported its statistics. 
However, herbicide use went up to 108%. So there is some indication that what the U.S. is doing has been beneficial for removing chemical, externally applied insecticides. And that's good news. We wanted to know what non-GM ecosystems were able to do in that same period of time. We had a look at France, Germany, and Switzerland. The French results are representative of all three. Insecticide use in orange and herbicide use in brown. By 2007, France had reduced chemical insecticide use to only 24% of its 1995 levels and was already redu reducing herbicide use instead of increasing herbicide use. By 2009, the last year the French government produced statistics, they were down to 12% of chemical insecticide use and down to 82% of their historical herbicide use. Another advanced agroecosystem using a different package of biotechnologies driven by different innovation strategies was able to significantly reduce insecticide use far more than the U.S. did. Relatively speaking, the package of biotechnologies that did not include the option of genetic modification was significantly better at reducing insecticide use than the package of biotechnologies that includes insecticidal plants. Another indicator of sustainability is whether the biotechnology will last. Even though these statistics now are 2012, the, the lesson is learned. The over-reliance on a very simple pest management strategy, in fact, ex almost exclusively for the herbicide Roundup in the United States, in the staple crop productions of cotton, uh, soy, and corn, has resulted in, for the first time, weeds that are resistant to glyphosate-based herbicides. And they are now on millions of hectares of the United States, necessitating a return to the one thing we thought was the benefit of the glyphosate-based herbicides, the lower toxicity, a return to higher, un indisputably higher toxicity herbicides. We also then looked at some of the socioeconomic considerations, such as agricultural biodiversity. This data comes from Monsanto. Monsanto was forced to produce this data because the Attorney General uh, had an antitrust suit against Monsanto, which mysteriously disappeared. But before it disappeared, Monsanto published this work, and we simply reorganized the numbers. So what you can see in this table are three crops, the biggest GM crops in the U.S., corn, soybean, and cotton. Traded is the way um, they refer to GM. So the traded are their GM offerings for germplasm, and conventional are other elite hybrid or other varieties that benefited from the latest germplasm development, just like they're traded, but without GM. And as you can see, the number of conventional crop varieties available to the U.S. farmer is decreasing. And it is decreasing substantially faster than the number of GM crop varieties. If a U.S. farmer, by 2010, wanted to grow conventional varieties, they would have 17% of the choice that they had for GM. So a much lower um, freedom to operate, a much lower choice in what they could, what they could look at which was another of our indicators of how the farming sector was changing. This is, of course, due to the monopolization of seed supply. If you look back to 1973, the concentration of the four largest companies providing corn germplasm for sale was 60%. The World Bank says you have monopoly problems whenever the CR4 exceeds 40 percent. So the U.S. has been struggling with the monopolization of the seed supply for quite some time. But dramatically, 
the concentration of the single largest supplier of corn seed in the U.S. by 2010 was 82% of the market. So it's off the charts. Soybeans are even more dramatic. The CR4 for soybeans was only 5% in 1980. And by 2010, there is a single supplier for 93% of the corn, of the soybean germplasm in the United States. So what are the lessons we have from the innovation of agriculture in the US? They have not low yields, but relatively low yields for an advanced agroecosystem that had other choices. They have a relatively high pesticide use. There's a concentration of breeder power that's resulting in lower germplasm biodiversity. It reduces farmer choices and therefore farmer power. And it is therefore then determining the outcome, which is something that we can't easily replace. You can't restore that farmer knowledge overnight. The big lesson here is that our agroecosystem is more than just genes. It isn't just about breeding plants. It isn't just about putting a new gene in a plant to get some kind of different outcome. It's about having healthy soil. It's about how you manage pests. It's about many, many different things. Europe has shown us that it's able to meet or exceed US yields and US yield gains without the emphasis on the latter part of breeding. It does so through a combination of farm management practices as well as breeding. So agriculture is not just genes. It is breeding, it's management, and it's also having the right social goals. GM is not the cause. Our analysis does not say that GM is the cause of all of these relative problems compared to Western Europe. However, GM is a sympathetic technology that it can be an accelerant to these trends, these innovation trends, that result in the outcomes we see in the United States. Our study was criticized, and the most significant criticisms that came from the study came from my own university in the School of Forestry. So we have now updated our study in response to those criticisms. The criticism was, the main criticism was, that by looking at 50 years of data, by actually looking at all the data, instead of just looking at a few years of data, what we may have done is underestimated the contribution of a relatively young but powerfully good biotechnology, GM. Now, we chose to look at the largest data set we could, because the larger your data set, generally speaking, the lower your chance of cherry picking data um, and introducing bias. So we looked at 50 years and 25 years in the original study. But we already knew why we couldn't look at the shorter period of GM development, and here I illustrate that. If you look at maize yields in the United States, up until the year from, from introduction, from major commercialization, which is 2001, 90% of all GM corn ever grown has been since 2001. If you look from 2001 to 2010, you see the slope of the line in red. This is the line that's usually used to advocate for the powerful benefits of GM. Add one year's data to that data set, and the slope decreases 28%. Add a second year to that data set, and the slope decreases another 78%. No one can use a data set that is so vulnerable to change from one additional piece of data. But if you also look at that period of time in which 90% of all the GM corn was ever grown, in that period of time, U.S. yields shown in red are flatlined. The broken blue line indicates what Western Europe was doing over the same period, 2001 to 2012. Their yields were increasing by 1,200. So over the period that we were asked to concentrate on, 
the U.S. agroecosystem was flatlined, and it was 90% of its GM maize. In the latter part of this data set, 90% of the corn being produced was GM maize. If you look over the period under which the U.S. was growing 75% of all the corn, GM corn that's ever grown, its yields were negative. But Western European yields were strongly positive. The choice Western Europe has made to grow, uh, in which to grow its corn, those choices have been increasing its yield unabated. And you can see that here. If you superimpose the two lines, the 50-year trend exactly matches the last 10-year trend for Western Europe. It is not jumping up and down by the addition of a single year's data. The U.S. system is. So how should we organize our agroecosystems? We have to think of our agroecosystems as a whole. There's a tendency to put everything into a box. Let's talk about food safety over here. Let's just talk about yield there. Let's just talk about pesticide here. Um, let's talk about patents over there. By putting them into these little boxes, we isolate them from one another, and we forget that agriculture is the big picture. Over 70% of the people on Earth do agriculture for a living. It's the big picture. We can't allow it to be put into small boxes. And that's why the ISTAT authors were so moved by the outcome of the, of the research um, that showed other approaches to agriculture may be even more important for developing countries than they even are for the advanced agroecosystems, the wealthy agroecosystems. This little snippet of data comes from a UN report looking at side-by-side -side trials of organic agriculture agroecological agriculture versus conventional. So country by country, site by site matched outcomes. What they found was that not only were yields much more increased under an agroecological output, sometimes up to 179% compared to conventional, but that all other socioeconomic indicators in the nearby villages also were positive. Gender relationships were better. Child health was better. Access to education was better. Agriculture is multifaceted. It affects every part of their lives. Agriculture is the way out of poverty. It is not what you do to subsist. Therefore, what choices you make in agriculture must be designed to meet those social goals, not just production goals. So what are our future directions? We need to choose, based on where we live, what kind of economy we have, what kind of farmers, what kind of environment, technological innovations and improvements that support our agroecosystem. Those appear to be ones that are agroecological. These technologies must be customized as necessary to the adopting agroecosystem. You don't export U.S. Midwest biotechnologies to the Congo. You find out what the Congo needs and how it would best develop its own agricultural system without ongoing black box dependence from a larger co country. And the main incentive system should be designed around sustainable societies rather than the short-term pursuit of the commodity we call intellectual property uh, and the invention of intellectual property instruments that further drive uh, a concentration of private wealth at the expense of farmer knowledge and consumer choice. Thank you very much.